How do you avoid startups that look really good, but then they just crash and burn after you join six months or a year later? Today, I'll talk about a startup called Fast, which raised hundred million dollars and a year later, it went bankrupt and it fired almost 500 employees. Now, I'm wearing an Uber t-shirt because this story will have some Uber reference as well, both in terms of people and also in some of the company trajectory. We'll talk about what happened at Fast, how they were able to hire from really good companies like Google, Facebook, and other big tech companies. But most importantly, what are things that you can look out for to avoid companies like this that will just burn quickly after you join? So what was Fast? It was a one-click checkout company. It was a small button on a website. You could click on it and you can make a purchase. And the reason this company got a bunch of funding is Amazon's patent of one-click checkout expired in 2017. And there was a gold rush in trying to fill this gap, hoping to build billion dollar companies. Fast was a pretty flashy company. They sold $1 hoodies on, on Twitter. In the US, a bunch of people order this. And their CEO was really flashy as well. Here's a video of when they opened an office in Tampa and the CEO got into a NASCAR car, did a few rounds, then got out of it, had someone put a pink jacket on him, and then he went on and start, started off some sort of press conference or whatever. Yeah, that, that was a CEO called Dominic Holland. So for a good year, people were hearing about Fast, they were doing a bunch of media press, the co-founders were really active on Twitter, but honestly there was not much going on externally. It seemed they were hiring, a bunch of people were joining it, people working at Uber were joining Fast as well. And then on Tuesday the 29th of March, The Information published an article about Fast. And this article was titled, Why Stripes Fast Horse is Losing the One-Click Checkout Race. And it had a damning fact. It said that the company only made $600,000 last year. It is failing to raise its Series C X next round of funding. And basically it was saying they're running out of money real quickly because they're burning about $10 million a month. Things start to speed up really quickly from here. So this was on Tuesday. On Wednesday, the information wrote another article where it was talking about how the company is planning to lay off about half its workforce as it's trying to convince investors to give them some money because it seems things were not going good. On Thursday, the information was talking on how fast hired Morgan Stanley to try to just sell the company on a fire sale. On Friday, one of the first engineers announced on Twitter that he was quitting. And on Tuesday, the company announced that they were shutting down. It's, it's game over, they're firing everyone, they ran out of money. It was a really quick collapse, basically in a week. It, it went from like, oh, this company's not doing great, to boom, everyone is fired. And I was talking to some people at the company at the time who had no clue what was going on. They were crossing their fingers that their jobs are safe, but it was not safe in the end. So how was Fast able to hire really good engineers? One thing that I was super surprised about is Fast had really good people. The head of engineering used to work at Uber. I, I knew this person, a really good engineering manager, and there were a lot of people who were hired. There was a person who worked at Google, Amazon, and Microsoft before this person joined Fast, and there was tons of people who had who previously worked at big tech for large compensation packages and somehow fast was able to convince them to join the startup. And as I talk with people, I got the details. So first of all, fast base salaries were top of the market. They were paying more cash than even big tech was paying to give you specific numbers. They were paying between 200 and $240,000 for a senior engineer, just in base salary. And they're also adding a twenty to fifty thousand dollar of signing bonus. Now you can get this type of salary at big tech as a senior engineer in the U.S., especially on the West Coast. But what Fast was doing is they hired people remotely. They told them they're permanently remote; they never have to come back to the office. So this kind of this offer was really tempting. And also they were hiring in Europe. In Europe, they offered the same thing. They actually said two hundred thousand dollars or one hundred eighty thousand euros to. It's all the way to 220,000 euros. And they gave these incredible salaries to people. Again, I know some people who took them and they couldn't believe their luck. Now this itself would have not been enough. The cash was good, but big tech pays a lot more because they issue stock as well. But here's where Fast was smart in their hiring. Fast sent each employee a Google Sheet which had a bunch of numbers on their equity. And first of all, they told them that this is super confidential. It's, we're only sharing it with you. Most candidates don't really get this uh, sheet shared with them. 
all candidates, by the way, had it shared with them. And they showed them a bunch of scenarios saying, here's your equity. And these are actually real numbers. I play around with a spreadsheet. I don't want to share the whole old spreadsheet here. And this is someone being granted 30,000 options at the current exercise price, which was 723 in, in, in this uh, table. And this was someone who was being paid, I recall, $240,000 or $220,000 in, in base salary. So they would show like, all right, like if Fast is worth $750 million, and the company, by the way, was worth about $500 million. But if it's worth $750, here's how much your net total compensation means. And by net, this was a little bit weird. Their net calculation just meant that they deducted the the exercise price. So it, this is still gross numbers, but the table somehow made it seem net. I, I, I don't know. Anyway, this is gross. So if the company is worth $750 million, your equity will probably be worth 346k per year sorry your total compensation and you'll have 500k equity outstanding for four years if it's worth 1.75 here are the numbers and if the company is worth 12 billion your annual total composition will be three million dollars and you have 11.3 million dollars standing out now the interesting thing about the 12 billion dollar valuation you might laugh at this like who, who would think this, this company is worth this much when they went bankrupt at the time this seemed actually pretty plausible because their biggest competitor bolt who was also one click checkout company they raised money at an 11 billion dollar valuation and the CEO of Fast and all the executives, they're really bullish on how they're growing big. They're going to overtake bold. They'll be even bigger. So a lot of people actually, when they're getting the offer, they were not looking at this number, which by the way, it was, was even higher than they got. Their equity was basically worth zero. But they were looking at this number. They said like, oh, wow, there's got, I have so much upside. If I stay at Facebook or at Google, my, my stock might double if I'm super lucky, maybe in four years. If I come to fast, the leadership made it seem sound like the company is so well funded, Stripe is behind it, Stripe was financing a good part of their round and they were leading around that nothing could go wrong and they'll arrive potentially at this $12 billion. But you know, if things don't work out three and a half billion, you're still making a million dollars a year. Easy peasy. Now the thing that fast did really smartly, which a lot of startups are doing right now, they visualize this value. They gave it to people and they were looking at it. And I talked with engineers who told me this was a reason assigned. They imagined all this money in their pocket, which was imaginary money, but it, it didn't matter. It was on a spreadsheet. Fast, by the way, never lied. They never said that this is a definite thing. It This spreadsheet had all the disclaimers that you need. But, you know, this is what happens when money messes with your mind and you hear about all these startups that go big, people are early. People who join in there honestly believe this is their lucky ticket. It's a pretty risk-free ticket because the company is growing and, and they just raise honestly hundred million dollars. Like, you know, like they'll, they'll raise another round and things will just be great. Now, one more thing that fast did towards the end of the year. So like in November and December, they started telling people you have a week to accept this offer or a few days because we're raising our series C it's closing and we cannot guarantee the price. And what most people did, they signed immediately because they're like, wow, well, they're, they're, they're raising their series C. Now, as we've learned, they never raised it. But again, this is where this communication might have been shady. I, I, I don't know. Maybe the founder really thought that they were close to close in series C. Uh, who knows? Anyway, this strategy worked. In December, they closed their CFO. They hired a senior vice president of engineering. All these people left really good jobs behind to come and work at this startup, which seemed like a really hot startup going up until it crashed up. What were the warning signs within the company? I talked with like close to a dozen engineers and managers who used to work at Fast, and I asked them, were there warning signs? And one engineer told me this, this thing, yes, there was a big warning sign. The CEO, Dominic Holland, he showed a hockey stick growth to a bunch of people a lot of times. And this hockey stick growth was headcount. So the y-axis, it was not revenue. It was not number of customers. It, it was it was how, how many people joined. I mocked up what this looked like based on the actual numbers. And this is what that would have count look like. If you ever see a chart like this, this means trouble because this means the company was burning through its money like there was no tomorrow. The other thing that was a warning sign for some senior engineers and engineering managers who joined at L6 and above, which means senior engineer and senior engineer and engineer manager and above, people got daily revenue numbers. So there was some level of transparency. These were tiny. So people were telling me these were like 250,000 or $300,000 per day in sales and fast took a one to 2% commission. So this meant like somewhere between 2000 and $6,000 in revenue per day. 
if you do the math, that does not look good at all. And I talked with an experienced engineering leader who the first time when they came in, they, they looked at these numbers and they looked at their infrastructure costs and FAST was paying more for infrastructure than their revenue coming in. So he was like, oh, uh, like this person thought, well, let's start to, you know, cut down on the infrastructure because because what's the point? And they had very few, relatively few requests. They had fewer than half a million requests per day for the FAST button. That's how many times it was rendered or, or, or fewer times, which meant like one or two requests per second. I mean, honestly, you don't need, they, they spun up a whole infrastructure to get ready to scale and to grow. But the mindset of people was like, ah, oh, well, I guess the numbers are small, but we're, we're, we're kind of, we're getting ready to grow. And the CEO was so charismatic that no one questioned the, the fact that there is nothing behind these statements. One thing that engineers notice is they just didn't have clients. When you're in payments, you kind of have two strategies that you can pursue. Either you go after a lot of small clients. There's tons of them. There's, you know, a thousand times more small clients, like small businesses or medium businesses, and you onboard into your platform. The good, th good thing about this is there's not maybe as much competition there. The problem is it's, it's a bit harder to close these, these uh, groups. And if you need to do integration with them, it's, it's going to take forever. The other strategy is go after the big clients, like close a few of the huge brands, uh, the, the, like, like huge shops who are doing billions or tens of billion dollars in revenue on their web shop and install your one-click checkout there. So there was these two strategies. Fast decided to go with the small clients. So they went after the hundreds or thousands or hundreds of thousands of small clients. But what the engineering team saw is it was really difficult to integrate each of them because each of them needed customization. And at some point, software engineers and engineering leaders went to the CEO saying, hey, we need to change the strategy because this is way too much work. It's, it's, just, it's just not working. We're making so little revenue for customer. It, it just doesn't make sense. Now, as far as I heard, the CEO said like, nope, we're keeping the direction. And um, when the inevitable crash came, these engineers said, told you so. Like, like we actually gave you a plan on how to extend the runway and save our costs, but we didn't hear anything. So that's something that I heard from inside the company. Another warning sign was how when the new CFO joined in December, this was the person who was the CFO of Venmo before. In December 2021, this person joined and the first thing they did in, in their first or second week is it a global hiring freeze. They said no more hiring. They didn't call it a freeze. It was a hiring slowdown. But the point was you couldn't extend any more offers on their, unless they were critical. Now, the only times you do a hiring freeze is when your finances are, are looking really bad. And the weird thing was that the CEO did not acknowledge this anywhere. In fact, he was boasting in the middle of January and how they were going at a blistering place and they welcomed 25 new hires. They had this so-called hiring slowdown in place. And by the way, the company still broke this hiring slowdown. There were still offers extended even during this time, even though they should have not done it. So people were kind of thinking like, well, there's some warning signs, but then they had a new senior vice president of engineering join the company who came from Okta. And there was an interview with Business Insider published in February where she was there and the CEO was there. And Fast CEO Dominic was saying that they plan to grow engineering heads count to 390. Now, bear in mind when they did the interview, this person already knew, the CEO knew that they were in trouble, but he just kind of, you know, I guess projected the whole fake it till we make it attitude. And yeah, employees looked at this interview and they said like, oh, well, everything looks fine. You know, we're going to raise our series C and everything will, will be just fine. Now, one thing that no one did, but I did, if software engineers would have calculated the annual burden rate for engineering, uh, assuming $200,000 per year in salary, multiplying it by, by the 150 engineers that FAST had, that number came out to $30 million a year just spent on engineering. And engineering was a third of the company. Now, the other, other two thirds were probably not as well paid, but we can do the math that just the salary cost at this point might have been around 70 or who knows, $80 million per year at the company. If you do the math, you realize the company is gonna run out of money unless they raise money. Again, didn't do the math. Now, one other interesting sign that came really late, Fast had two co-founders actually. There was Dominic Cullen, who we hear about it on all the press, and there was Alison Bar Allen, who I happen to know because I worked with her at, at Uber, so here's the Uber connection. She was a co-founder at Fast, and a lot of Uber people joined because of her, because she worked at Uber, she, she brought that uh, network, she worked on payments operations when I was there. And what happened is about two weeks before the company shut down, she disappeared. 
couldn't be reached, didn't reply to emails, messages, nothing. I actually have people who I know message me saying, hey, Allison disappeared, is this a good sign? And I, I told them, if a co-founder disappears, it's never a good sign. And she was never heard of afterwards as well. Uh, there, there were statements from, from, Dom, from, from Dominic Hall and the CEO about the company. There were no statements from her. So just, you know, I guess a warning sign, if a co-founder goes completely radio silent, things might be going poorly. Finally, the first real warning sign that people could actually just make sense of and just start to get scared is 11 days before the company was shut down on the Friday All Hands, the CEO Dominic said, our Series C is delayed. And this was on a Q&A. People started asking like, is this going to be layoffs? What's going to happen? He just ended the Q&A. And so people started talking. Uh, a few days later, the information article came out and then the company exploded. If you like these videos, but you would like more content, sign up to my weekly newsletter at pragmaticengineer.com. It's the number one technology newsletter on Substack. It's free to sign up, but there's also a paid version. And if you work at a company which has a learning and development budget and you work in tech, you can probably expense it. A lot of subscribers do. Check it out at pragmaticengineer.com. Now, what advice would I have to eliminate the kind of the next fast when you're joining a startup? Because the reality is, a lot of companies have raised tons of money and companies that raise $100 million or more look like a safe bet, but as we can see from this story, they're not. And I predict we're gonna see more companies that raise a lot of money, lay people off and sometimes just shut down because they'll run out of money and just like fast, they will not be able to raise anymore. So here's my eight pieces of advice. First, do your research on the company and on the founders. In the case of Fast, I actually did this because I was approached by one of my colleagues at Uber who worked at Fast in 2020 saying, hey, you should totally join this startup. And I did some digging and what I found did not look good. I found a lot of details on, on, on the CEO, Dominic, who turns out to be a pretty shady character. There's an article that was written in 2018 about him uh, liquidating uh, his company, firing people via text messages. He was threatening to sell personalized data. And if you search online, there's also stories of him blackmailing an Australian airline for a domain. Uh, and he also seems someone who just doesn't take responsibility for his actions. This was pretty clear. And to me, this was a deal breaker. I, I was thinking I would never work at a company where the CEO is, is like this. And surprise, surprise, what, what, what happened? You know, history repeating itself. He shut down his previous company and fired all people. Second time around, exactly the same outcome. I don't want to throw dirt on people who don't deserve it, but do your research and look at patterns. If you see a founder with a certain pattern, for example, all of their previous companies are, are shut down or they don't seem to be respecting people and just mass firing them without talking to them, maybe that's what they're going to do at their next company as well. And surprise, surprise, in this case, this is what happened at Fast. Second, ask for the numbers. Ask about how much runway does a company have left? How much revenue are they generating? How much money are they burning? If they don't give you these numbers, that's a yellow flag or sometimes a red flag. If a company is not willing to be transparent about people who are about to join, especially if you offer to sign an NDA, something is off there. Fast did not give these numbers to people and people still joined. The results we've seen. Number three, ask if there are a clear set of business metrics that the business tracks, the startup tracks for what their success looks like, and is this visible to every employee? If you asked this question for fast, the answer would have been no. Employees did not have access to business metrics unless you were leadership. Now, this is a problem because companies like fast, which don't track the important metrics, which is revenue, number of customers, they're at risk of focusing on the wrong thing. Employees that fast build all this cool stuff, they never knew that revenue was at risk or they didn't have enough customers. They just kept doing their thing jollily. And this is dangerous at startups. Any startup that does not have a laser focus on what is important to them in terms of their, their business metrics and they don't share it with anyone, it's not gonna be a good startup. Before you join, reverse interview the people you'll be working with. So set up a call after you get an offer, everything looks good. Set up a call with your future manager or teammates and ask about what it's like to work in the company. I wrote an article on reverse interviewing your future manager and your team. Check it out in the link below.
Number five, ask to talk with investors. This is especially important if you're a leadership position. Now, investors like, like VCs, they're gonna be typically selling you when you're talking to them, but you're gonna get some interesting information. Ask them about why they invested, what metrics do they care about, what other portfolios do they have, what are the risks that they're seeing. You might get some additional pieces of information and in reality, very few people do this, even though investors always say no to talking with people. If they if they don't want to talk to you as someone as a company that which is not even a late stage startup, something might be off. Number six, talk to people who've left. On LinkedIn, search for people who have left in a similar position. So if you're applying for a software engineer position, search for software engineers who have left and message them. The best money you can spend is just buy the LinkedIn premium or whatever you need to message these people and ask them like, hey, I'm about to join this company. I saw you left. Would you mind sharing why did you leave and, and what are your thoughts on the company? You're going to get really good information. And one of my friends did the exact same trick when he got an offer from a really good company, uh, which had a really good press. It was this revolutionary company and he got a really good package and a really good equity and, and he was about to accept it, but he did this. He messaged, he saw people who were leaving. He messaged them and the people said like, do not join. It's, it's, it's a mess, it's gonna go under. This company was called Theranos. And my friend avoided joining a few months before the big scandal erupted. Number seven, if you're getting a director above position, do your back channel with the, your, with the VC network. At this level, hopefully you have some VC connections. If not, just make some connections. Don't just reach out to the companies that invested, but try to reach out into the VC network of large investors who might have passed. Because a lot of times there, there are whisper networks about why a company is doing well and they might feel bad that they never invested, or there's some whisper networks of why the company is doing poorly. In the case of Fast, anyone who would have done this would have heard some news on, on how VCs are already passing. They've already passed on their Series C because they thought the metrics were terrible. Number eight, make a plan if your stock is worth nothing. A lot of people go into these startups and they see these numbers and, and they think it's real money. It's not. Your stock is not real until it's vested and un until there's a liquidity event, which is two really big conditions at companies. Most startups, if you get equity, it's not going to be worth anything. Just keep this in mind. So make a plan. Will it be worth you joining this company if all you get is your base salary? Will that work out? Will it help your career in terms of the opportunities that you get? You might have a lot larger responsibility. You might work on this interesting set of problems. If it's only worth it, if you make a lot of money on the stock, uh, you'll probably be disappointed. And finally, note that risk and reward are connected. Startups are risky and they do have a high upside, but it can also turn into zero. If you go to a publicly traded company, there's not much risk. And if you take a job that has no equity, I mean, you don't really have any risk going on there, except for being terminated, which is a risk that you always have. And my biggest advice is understand how businesses work. For any business to survive, they need to become profitable at some point. There is business models of companies not being profitable, and Uber is a great example. Uber had, had not been profitable for, what, 10 or, or something years? and it's now just turning into profitable, but there needs to be a path for profitability. And in the case of Uber, in the early days, they didn't have a deliberate path, but it was always clear that their model was, let's win the market, let's try to get a monopoly as much as we can, we can then turn up prices and become profitable, or our operation will scale and our costs to operate will go down. And in the case of Uber, this actually worked pretty well in the sense of every year the losses were going down and inside the company, Uber was pretty efficient because of its scale. One example is the size of Uber's payment team. I, I was on the payments team and we were the ones who were integrating with a lot of different uh, payment providers. We had about 20 engineers and we supported 65 countries. We built all those payment providers and we were able to do this because we're a centralized team in an organization. Now, all of Uber's competitors had similar sized teams just supporting the fewer payment methods that that company had. So this was one piece of efficiency that worked in the case of Uber. And of course, when it came to Uber, the unit economics did make sense. Uber charged $100, uh, they paid the driver, let's say $80 or 85 or 75, and they kept a cut and they made sure that the company operated from that money. And when I joined, I, I did my due diligence in terms of how many people use Uber, how is it growing. And it was clear that the company was losing money, but it was also clear that that, that loss is because of the new market launches. And in the mature markets, 
the company was actually making money. So this all helped my decisions on why to join Uber. And I, and again, it's a risk, right? Uber could have gone down under, the same way that Fast eventually did, but just know that these things are connected and know that you're taking a risk. And you know, if you go to a startup and your stock is not worth anything, you really don't have anyone to blame. No one promised you. In the case of Fast, no one promised people they would become millionaires or if they did, I mean, they were clearly lying. You shouldn't, you shouldn't listen to those things. This, this is how it happened. People got paid their base salaries. They lost their jobs, but hopefully most of them will find good opportunities. If you want to learn more about how compensation works with the three different tiers of local compensation to how startups typically compensate all the way to how big tech pays, check out my video on the trimodal nature of compensation, where I go into a lot more details and it might give you an idea of why there are different tiers of companies and what the differences are between them. Thanks and see you at the next one.